The words I would use to describe Mike as a scientist would be totally energized, very intense, and um, enthusiastic. And the enthusiasm for the question was completely infectious. He was the first and only person I interviewed as an undergrad to work in his lab, and I, I was just completely taken. I first met Mike when I was um, a beginning, a uh, very beginning graduate student. He was the first person I rotated with. You go to graduate school, you do a rotation with faculty. I'd read about his work, and he had an incredible intensity and passion to him uh, of a type that I really hadn't seen in the scientists. First time I met Michael Chamberlain was when I interviewed for a job here in the biochemistry department in 1981 and Mike was a, a legend among those of us at Stanford at the time because of his remarkable thesis and what really struck me was not just how intense he was as a scientist but what a warm human being he was to any potential incoming faculty. Mike's research is so important because there are very few processes in the entire field of biology that are more important to every single aspect of uh, human biology than transcription. Transcription is the process that decides which genes are going to be made and at what amount they're going to be made. And it is what goes wrong when we get diseases such as cancer. Mike was interested in a very fundamental question, which is, you have a long sequence of DNA with a very complicated sequence, that's our genes, our genomes, he wanted to understand how it was that an enzyme, which is a protein, is able to find out of how many billions of nucleotides a particular sequence to sit down and begin making RNA. And that's a basic question in all of molecular biology and all of humankind. Between 1962 and 1964, he published five of the most important papers on one of the most important enzymes in the entire field of gene regulation. Jacobin Monod in 1960 had laid out how, from genetic criteria, genes were regulated, but nobody had ever understood what the molecules were that did it. And Mike, as a graduate student, took on the most difficult challenge of the time, which was to find the enzyme, now called RNA polymerase, that makes RNA copies of DNA. These five papers sort of laid the groundwork for everything that we needed to know at that time about how bacterial cells control the expression of genes. He was one of the pioneers, uh, certainly his work with Paul Berg in discovering E. coli RNA polymerase, one of the very pioneers in, in finding the enzymes that do that, and in finding the steps of those enzymatic processes that might be involved. The first paper that I turned in to Paul was all red ink. <laughs> and all I can say about that is he sets high standards. This is something that Paul showed me, and, and it's true. You keep on working on the paper until it, it's perfect. For 15 years, my colleague Fred Winston and I uh, have taught the paper that Mike wrote as a single author about the discovery of T7 RNA polymerase, and every year we teach it. The students, even in the 2000s, think it's one of the most interesting and coolest papers that they, they read. Um, the backdrop to that was at that point in time, everybody thought that specificity of transcription came from sigma, something called a sigma factor, that it was an extra protein that was added to the polymerase, and that all specificity worked that way. And Mike used the phage T7 to show that T7 did it differently. It encoded its own polymerase, and that polymerase was specific by itself. It did not need additional sigma factors. And it completely ruffled the feathers of all of the most important people in the field. He was a pioneer in that area, and in many uh, cases, ahead of his time in terms of thinking about how that process goes on. And so even though he was working in that area at a time uh, before there were a lot of technological advances that we have today to understand these questions, he made many really important and influential uh, contributions to our understanding of that really fundamental process. The personality of a scientist and the style with which they do research motivates a whole team of young people 
to not only contribute to the research of that laboratory, but to go forward in their own laboratories and bring that enthusiasm to their students, their postdoctoral fellows, to carry the whole field of research forward. Mike was also so, I would say, so influenced by his mentors, Paul Berg and Arthur Kornberg, and really wanted to hold the highest standard that they set in his uh, uh, graduate training. He had consistent high standards. We all knew he had consistent high standards. We knew if we joined his lab, we were going to be held to consistent high standards. It wasn't a secret to anybody in the entire Berkeley campus, or for that matter, in the entire uh, transcription community. I had a chemistry student, actually. He was doing experiments with antibodies, and I said, are they purified or are they impure? And he said, oh, I think it's purified. But he didn't know. And I said, if you say something like that, people are going to basically write you off because you didn't know the difference between one thing and another. And you didn't take the time to find out. About five or six years later, I got nominated for basically a, an honorarium which was only awarded to people whose graduate students all agree uh, that that person was superior. He was the one who nominated me. Because he was such a demanding advisor, that really pulled the team together. Everybody had, there was really close feeling among members of the team that we were in this together. We were in this pushing the science forward. And Mike was this energetic, magnetic figure sort of leading the troops. It was one of the happiest phases of my life because we not only did science together, we hung out and drank beer together, we ate food together, we danced together, we played golf together, we did everything together. Um, and, and what drew us together was, was a love of, of, uh, love of the process, love of the uh, process of discovery. Arthur Kornberg and Paul Berg to this day probably are Mike's top heroes in all the world of science. And what an honor for him to be receiving this award from the Alumni Association named after Dr. Berg and Dr. Kornberg. I think about Mike on a regular basis as I run my own laboratory. Uh, I am very proud of the fact that I've trained 30 graduate students. Um, and. Um, in training them, I've realized just what a spectacular job he did and how much energy he put into training all of us. This award named after Arthur Karberg and, and Paul Berg is especially appropriate for Mike Chamberlain. First of all, because of his legendary work under the tutelage of Paul Berg at Stanford, but more importantly by the impact that it has made globally because many Americans, myself included, have received injections in our arms of vaccines, mRNA vaccines this year, that were made possible by the pioneering work that Mike Chamberlain did on bacteriophage RNA polymerases in the 70s and 80s. Just as is true for Mike Chamberlain today, Paul Berg and Arthur Kornberg are among my scientific heroes, and how wonderful that the circle is closed, that now they gave to him not only his training and uh, ability to be the scientist that he is, but now he can also be honored by them and the Stanford Alumni Association.